Well, have you ever been fooled by a fake or some sort of counterfeit? I read a story this week about a guy named Michael McCoy who was arrested on counterfeit charges. And originally he had been arrested for selling fake Pokemon cards. Uh, I don't know if you know about Pokemon, but uh, evidently it's a pretty big deal. There's some, some high-end Pokemon cards that people will pay uh, top dollar for. And he had gotten online and uh, it was creating them and selling them and packing them off as real. And so he gets busted for it. Well, uh, as soon as he's released, he goes back to his counterfeiting ways. And this time, he decides to start passing off fake gold coins. And so he's got these gold coins and he meets somebody and he trades the gold coins for a 13th century Japanese katana um, plus about $7,000. So in total, it was about $20,000 worth of items. And he, he basically traded it in for for. Literally nothing. I mean, just absolutely no value fake gold coins. Well, um, he was busted on it, and thankfully, you know, they they caught him. Um, I don't know that they've been able to return the money to the person he he took advantage of. But there's so many people out there who who really will try to take advantage of of others by putting out something that's false. And a highly trained expert can tell the difference between something that's false and something that's real. But in order to to tell the difference, you've got to know what's authentic. Uh, I love this quote by a guy named John MacArthur. He's a pastor and author. He says this, he says, federal agents don't learn to spot counterfeit money by studying counterfeits. They study genuine bills until they master the look of the real thing. Then when they see the bogus money, they recognize it. So in order for us to really understand what Christianity is, and to understand how false teaching can lead us astray, we've got to know the truth. Because if you don't know the truth, it's so easy to be pulled off in the wrong direction. Because oftentimes, those who are good at counterfeiting can make it seem like it's right. It can sound very Christian-ish. It can sound very spiritual. Um, But if we don't know the truth... Uh, We can't distinguish truth from error. And that's really what this whole series has been about. And I I hope it's been helpful for you. It's been a very different series for us here at Coastal, but I hope comparing uh, Christianity to other world religions has given you some of that perspective. Um, Today's going to be a little bit different. We're going to look at not only Christianity, but we're going to look at uh, really kind of how Christianity can be distorted into a hyper-mystical version of it and, and see some of the dangers that come with that. And then next week, Jonathan Brennick, who's been our interim college pastor over the last uh, few months, will preach and talk about Christian legalism. And so I hope you'll be here uh, for that as he, he wraps up this series. Uh, and by the way, that will also be Jonathan's last Sunday at Coastal before we commission him and a couple other families out uh, to Tucson uh, to, to join the Cummings family Uh, as they're planting a church there. So um, you want to be there uh, next Sunday. It's going to be a a special Sunday in the life uh, of our church. All right, so we've been studying the book of Galatians. So if you have a a Bible with you, go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians is in the New Testament. Um, If you don't have a copy of the scriptures with you, you can follow along on the screens. Um, But a little bit of background. So Galatians was written by the, the great New Testament writer and missionary, the Apostle Paul who once was a Jew, and then God radically transformed his life, and he becomes uh, a great missionary. And he understood the gospel in a way that, um, and was passionate about the true gospel um, in a way that, that just drove his ministry. Like over and over again, he wanted to make sure people understood that a person is justified not by being really good or by being really religious, but by putting their faith alone in Jesus Christ. And so he he writes this letter to the Galatians because they were starting to get off track. There were people who were coming back in and said, hey, listen, faith in Jesus is great, but you're going to also need to do this other stuff. In fact, they were actually getting 
people to try to convert back to Judaism so they could then convert to Christianity. That they would have to embrace all the things that the law had taught them before they could fully be Christian. And so it was creating controversy in the church and really distorting the gospel. And so um, Paul's whole letter is about clarifying that. And that's where we're going to pick up. Um, We're going to start in verse 13 today. It says this. It says, For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by one another. Now, a little historical context here. So as the, the churches in Galatia were arguing over Hey, should a person have to be circumcised before they get to join our church? Is that like uh, something that should become a membership requirement? Uh, It created some division. There was controversy. And so people were always going back and forth about it. And and you can imagine sometimes uh, a, a theological concept can get personal. And personal attacks were starting to happen. And I think that's a, that's a good word for us today, even as we dive into a topic that, that really is kind of affecting how Christians relate to each other, and differences, even how different Christian denominations or traditions might see certain issues, that the way we approach it is love. Some of the um, discernment ministries that you may see online have a reputation for for really valuing truth, but they don't do it in love. There's an arrogance to it. There's a pridefulness to it. And that's not going to be our approach today. Uh, we're going we're to discuss these things out of a spirit of unity uh, because we care about truth, because we, we actually long to, to follow Jesus and to do the things that he's told us to do and to, to worship him in spirit and truth, but we're going to do it in a loving sort of way. Then he continues, verse 16. He says, I say then... Walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you don't do what you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, a couple terms that are important to understand here. He talks about the Spirit and the flesh. And what happens is, is when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, meaning that when we trust that what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross, that it was sufficient for the forgiveness of our sins, that God forgives our sins and and really secures our eternal destiny. But he doesn't just say, hey, listen, um, good luck here on earth. He actually gives us his spirit to live within us, to change us from the inside out, to empower us. He gives us spiritual gifts. And so we have this Spirit of God who actually now lives in us and desires to make us more and more like Jesus. And I wish I could say that the moment you step over the line of faith, that there would be this instant sanctification. There would this be instant process where you no longer desired sinful things and you you no longer gave in to your, your selfish desires. But that's not the case. And we still have that sinful nature, that, that flesh in us. And so every single Christ follower who lives has this tension in us, where we have the Spirit of God in us, but we also have our flesh. And he says they are at war and they want what is opposite of each other. Now, how do we know if we're being led by the Spirit? Because the Spirit is, is actually going to, cause us to to do the things that God wants us to do. In fact, um, there's never going to be a time where God goes against himself, that that following him is is about having a relationship with him, but it's actually going to be consistent with who he is and his character and his goodness. And so how do we know if it's, it's the Holy Spirit or if we just ate a bad burrito? How do we know? Well, on June 4th, I'm going to preach about it. So you got to come back, okay? So mark that in your calendar, June 4th. We're going to talk about how do we discern the will of God? How do we determine if it's God's spirit in us? What does that look like for us? But, but for now, just know that God expects us not just to follow a set of religious rules and re- regulations, but he is giving us his living spirit. So uh, it's a relationship with Jesus, not just adherence to religious rules and standards, that we actually have God's Spirit in us, working in us, and leading us. 
Verse 19, now the works of the flesh, that sinful nature, now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. I'm warning you about these things as I warned you before. That those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, we like to, to have a, a pretty interactive sort of service. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go down that list. And if you struggle with any of those sins, will you just stand? Just, just stand right where you are. Here's my guess. If I got to the end of the list... We'd all be standing. So what does that mean? Does that mean that none of us have the Spirit of God in us? Is that what that means? No. No, it's talking about a pattern of behavior. Like if you look at the, the whole of your life, and, and this has been an ongoing, continual thing where you don't see transformation. You don't, you don't see God at work in your life, that you're increasingly uh, looking more and more like Jesus, thinking like Jesus, acting like Jesus, then that becomes a big red flag. Like you have to start to wonder, hey, do you really understand the gospel? Because if a person really is saved, there's going to be transformation happen. Does that mean perfection? No. But it means that there's real transformation happening. And so the, the works of the flesh are obvious. Like we, we know it. And in fact, we typically know it when we're doing it. We know it. We go, man, that was not Jesus in me. Like that was not Jesus coming out. Happy Mother's Day. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. Here's the main idea of this passage. I'm trying to say it as, as clearly as I can. Um, the fruit or the evidence of the Holy Spirit is Christ-like character. The way you know if a person has the Holy Spirit, is that their character bears spiritual fruit. And that character begins to resemble Jesus Christ. It is a crucified sort of character. That's what it is. That's what it is. It's, it's not actually our spiritual giftedness. It's not some of the other outward signs that sometimes people may think of, it's love, it's joy, it's peace, it's patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's what it looks like. And as you mature in your faith, those character traits, those attributes are going to come out in your life. And, and that's, we inherently, I think, kind of know that because when we meet people who we would say, man, that is a spiritually mature person, those are the things that are true of them, right? Those are the things that we admire about them and that we acknowledge because it just feels like, man, that, that's exactly the way Jesus would act. Like, I saw you interact the way Jesus would interact. I saw you react to a difficult circumstance the way Jesus would react to a difficult circumstance. And so um, I want to push pause there because I, I think that's a good place to say, hey, to be clear, this is what the evidence of the Holy Spirit is. And now I want to talk about what the evidence of the Holy Spirit is not. And again, I want to make a little bit of a disclaimer here because um, we're going to talk about some of the gifts of the Spirit that um, fall into the more supernatural category or the more kind of charismatic category. Uh, and what I am not saying is that if you are a charismatic Christian, that you are somehow outside of orthodoxy. So when I think about um, the, the bounds of orthodox Christianity, 
I think there are very much people who are charismatic in their theology and in their practice, but are, are orthodox theologically. But there's some extremes that then go outside of orthodoxy, that go outside of that. And we're going to be talking about um, the stuff that goes outside of that today. Um, so you could call that Christian mysticism. Uh, another name for that that you may come across is called the New Apostolic Reformation, uh, or the NAR. And uh, the reason why that is called that is because it's a movement that believes that the office of apostle and prophets are for today. That it's not just part of what God was doing in the, the New Testament days, but that there are currently modern day apostles who have similar roles to what we see with the apostle Peter and the apostle Paul. Um, they wouldn't necessarily say they're exactly on the same level, but, but they would say pretty close. That they, they, they are in the same lineage uh, and tradition. Now that is different, by the way, from someone who would say, I believe that there are people who have apostolic giftings. And so I would be one of those who would say, listen, I, I think I've got some apostolic giftings. Church planters, missionaries, people who are starting new ministries have apostolic giftings, but I don't have an, I'm not a, an apostle in that sense. Uh, and there are also people who I think speak prophetically, who God uses them to speak into actually current events. But when I think about prophecy in modern day kind of Christianity, I think it's more about speaking into current events with biblical insight and spiritual insight than it is um, foretelling future events. I actually think that would be extremely rare. I'm not saying that God couldn't do it, but I think it would be extremely rare that that's how God would operate. So, um, for further study on this, I'm going to put this screen up. A um, couple resources. One is called Counterfeit Kingdom. And we actually have this book today at the Resource Center. Uh, it's a pretty new book. just came out. Highly recommend it. And it's, it's about the dangers of new revelation, new prophets, and the new age practices in the church. Uh, and um, both this book and the next one are written by Holly Pivick and Doug Guyvet. And, and both of these guys treat the topic with sensitivity and with academic excellence. So these guys are not just approaching this topic like, hey, you know, um, we've got an ax to grind, um, but they've actually studied this like researchers would. And, and it's well documented. There's footnotes. Like they're, they're not just saying these things. Uh, it's, it's empirically based evidence and research. And so I really appreciate that about their uh, approach. And it's, it's solid. It's good stuff. Um, another book that you could check out is called Defining Deception uh, by a guy named Costi Hinn. Costi Hinn is the nephew of a guy named Benny Hinn. Uh, you may have heard of Benny Hinn. He's a world famous evangelist and prosperity gospel preacher. He's the guy typically in an all white suit who has big miracle crusades and he's, he's going touch, touch. And he's like, people are all falling out in the room and stuff. So, uh, Costi grew up with his, under his uncle's ministry and, uh, actually basically God opened his eyes to what was happening. And now is a, a much more, uh, evangelical, a solid biblical preacher and a pastor of a local church. And so he talks about some of his, his experiences in that movement. Um, another a couple of videos, if you're like, man, I can barely read. Um, uh, if you would be more of an a audiovisual person, um, there's a great interview with Alyssa Childers. She's an apologist who I highly recommend her stuff, actually, by the way. Um, and she did a, an interview with um, Doug Guyvick and Holly Pivick. And it's called Bethel Redding and Modern Apostles, a Biblical Analysis. It's, it's over an hour long, so it'll take you a while to get through it. But it's very thorough and, and very helpful, uh, very insightful. Um, and then in a smaller video, it's only about 20 minutes long, Costi Hen does something called The Ugly Truth About the Prosperity Gospel. Um, that'd be something that you could check out as well. So a little bit of homework, a little bit of research if, if you want to geek out on this kind of stuff, and I'm always glad to answer any questions uh, after the service or email or whatever. All right, so let's clarify a couple things, all right? I'm going to give you three big differences on this. 
So the, the fruit or the evidence of the Holy Spirit is not, number one, it's not the ability to speak in tongues, proclaim prophecy, or perform miracles. Uh, this movement teaches that every Christian, every Christian has the capacity to unlock their supernatural spiritual gifts. And that if you aren't practicing these things, then that somehow you are missing out. Um, and then some might even go as so far to say you don't actually even have the Spirit because uh, these things are so synonymous with the Holy Spirit for them. I'll give you a couple example, examples. A guy named Chris Vallotton, who is a considers himself to be um, kind of the primary prophet at Bethel Church in California, says this. He says, when we take our rightful place, seated with Christ on his heavenly throne, we live powerfully, offensively, and relatively peacefully. Our prayers become prophetic declarations that direct history. The kingdom within us begins to direct the world around us so that we're no longer victims, but victors. So his per perspective is, is pretty strong there. Um, another lady who's associated with, with Bethel, her name is Judy Franklin, wrote a book called The Physics of Heaven, uh, which, is, quite frankly, is an unapologetic attempt to blend New Age practices and teachings with Christianity. And, and she literally says that in the book. Like she says, hey, I went to New Mexico, I studied New Age practices and teachings, and my goal was to try to, to take out from the New Age movement things and then incorporate it into Christianity and, and move it. And here's what she says. Uh, she says, Jesus calmed storms. We should be able to do that too. Jesus healed the sick, cast out demons, and raised the dead. We have the same power within us. And we also have power all around us undergirding our universe. So that's a pretty bold claim, right? That, that essentially, if you are a follower of Jesus, that you should be able to do anything that Jesus did. And that, that comes from the idea that Jesus did all of his earthly ministry as a man in right relationship with God. That somehow Jesus basically shut off his divinity during his time on earth, and was essentially just like us. And he is a model for us because he, he was just a man like us, and he was basically just a godly man. And so if, if Jesus did it, then we can do it too. That's kind of the, the premise of that. That is, of course, completely false because there was never a moment that Jesus quit being God. Uh, now, he, he veiled some of his grandeur and glory because even just to look at God would have literally melt our face off, right? Like, I mean, we cannot be in God's presence unless he allows us to be in his presence. Uh, and so God veils some of his glory uh, even while he walked the earth. But that doesn't mean he stopped being God at any point. Now, compare that to what the Apostle Paul says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he says this. He says, are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all do miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? And he asks that series of questions, and, and the clear rhetorical answer to that is no. He's saying, listen, no, we, we actually all play different roles in the body of Christ. And so not everyone's going to speak in tongues. Not everyone's going to do miracles. Not everyone's going to uh, have gifts of healing. And so even in the, the early church New Testament context, so whether you're, you're a person who believes that those gifts are active for today or a person who believes that those gifts were just for the season, regardless of where you land on that, the text actually is true, which is that would not be for everybody. Right? That's, that is not universally uh, available. And so it cannot be that the test of whether or not a person has the Holy Spirit is if you speak in tongues. It cannot be that the test, is if you have the Holy Spirit, is that you do miracles. Right? That cannot be the test. That is not the litmus test that we see described in the Bible. Um, and it's not reality. 
All right, here's the second thing. The fruit of the Spirit is also not financial prosperity and perfect health. This is also called the prosperity gospel. Let me give you a couple uh, quotes and examples of this. Bill Johnson, who's the, uh, the apostle of Bethel, the main pastor and leader of Bethel, says this. He says, Jesus destroyed the power of sin, sickness, and poverty through his redemptive work on the cross. In Adam and Eve's commission to subdue the earth, they were without sickness, poverty, and sin. Now that we are all restored to his original purpose, should we expect anything less? After all, this is called the better covenant. Uh, and Benny Hinn, who is Kasi's uncle, says this. He says, there will be no sickness for the saint of God. If your body belongs to God, it does not and cannot belong to sickness. Okay. <laughs> um, man, I could do like a whole lot on this one. But uh, let me just say this. Um, what is true is that there are biblical principles in your life that if you apply, your life will benefit. And we've talked about that. Like, th th there is blessing when we see obedience. That doesn't mean like there's going to be perfection, but like if, if you learn to manage your finances the way God tells you to manage your finances, there's going to be benefit to that. But that doesn't mean that you're going to be wealthy and you're going to have your own private jet. Um, and the fact that one day God will heal us perfectly in heaven, and we will have bodies that are perfect, that never get sick and never get injured, doesn't mean that our bodies right here and right now are not subject to sin and decay and brokenness. Because the reality is, is that this, this finite human flesh is going to break down. And, and, and guess what? People get sick at Bethel too, and they don't make it, right? Like they, they, they have deaths. They have funerals there too. Like the, the, the death rate is the same at all churches. And so the idea that that there, there's, there's no sickness for believers or, or no injuries is just, is, it's just not found in the, the Bible. And, and in fact, what the Bible warns us about is that as we get serious about following Christ, we can expect to encounter uh, spiritual warfare, that Satan's going to come after us, that life can be hard sometimes, and that our bodies will, will, will suffer, that we may face persecution. I mean, think about the Apostle Paul himself, 2 Corinthians. Here's his experience, okay? Um, and, and, and I guess the prosperity gospel teachers would just tell Paul he's just doing it wrong, okay? But, but here's Paul. He says, five times I received the 40 lashes minus one from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. I've spent a night and a day in the open sea. On frequent journeys, I faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, and dangers among false brothers. Toil and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold and without clothing. Not to mention other things, there is this daily pressure on me, my concern for all the churches." Evidently, he was not living his best life now. Like, evidently, Paul missed the memo because he should have been traveling around the ancient world in luxury and style and never getting sick, never having, just living in the Lord's favor, right? No, that was not his experience. Guess what happened to all the apostles? They were martyred, all of them. Right? So following Jesus is the best way to live. It is the most fulfilling way to live. But the Bible makes no promise that we're going to be without suffering. No promise. None at all. all right, and then the third thing here is that the fruit or the evidence of the Holy Spirit is, is not emotional experiences during worship services. And I'll give you a couple of behaviors that you may, may see sometimes in worship services, particularly in these kinds of services, uh, where people fall to the ground, otherwise known as being slain in the spirit, uh, feel, feeling, uh, uh, feeling drunk, 
Uh, sometimes it's called being drunk in the spirit, uh, uncontrollable laughter. There have been times where people will roll on the floor and uh, bark like a dog. Um, there's uncontrollable shouting or crying, uh, shaking and trembling, uh, running and jumping. Uh, and these kind of, kind of extreme behaviors, for some, would say, hey, listen, if you're doing this, it's because, man, you must really have the Holy Ghost. And you must really have a deep relationship with the Spirit. Because if you really have an encounter with God, it's going to lead you to, to do some crazy stuff. Uh, and, and just to give you an example of that, there's a guy named Apostle Shay Ann, who's one of the, the main leaders in this movement. You may have not have heard of him, but he actually runs a, a, a huge school where he trains up apostles. It's one of his deals. He's in Pasadena, California, and he describes um, his kind of apologetic for that. Check this out. Here, and I've said it this way. Look, if I touch electricity, raw electricity, I, and I'm going to... I'm gonna shake, I'm gonna react to that uh, electrocution, right? That is uh, that is a, a very physical power, but we're talking about the power of God, which is much more powerful than electricity. You know, God who created this universe, and if God wants to touch someone, and they begin to shake, or they begin to manifest, again, he's God and we're not, and he can do whatever he wants to do, and so, so uh, yeah, some, some of it is weird, but again, I use the analogy of when you talk about the power of God and you're talking about something that's even, something that's of a different dimension, transcends even the physical power of electricity. And if we're gonna re react uh, with physical electricity, how much more when God shows up and he touches us? Yeah, so that's that perspective, right? Is is the idea is like, hey, if you're gonna have an, a genuine encounter with the spirit, it, it would you're gonna you're just gonna it's gonna manifest in some some kind of crazy ways. Now, uh, let me let me say kind of some some asterisks to this, okay? Um, is it okay to be demonstrative when you encounter God's spirit in a powerful way? Absolutely, absolutely. Man, there are times where, man, you are just in worship and you want to raise your hands. You may drop to the, your knees and, and bow down in worship. You may have moments where, like, you just can't say anything. Uh, and your response is just to sit in silence. Literally, just to sit. Because you're just so humbled by the presence of God. Like, the, all those responses are okay. Right? Like, it, it's not about that. But it's it's also not about losing control, right? The fruit of the Spirit, one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control, not, not a lack of control. It's not like losing it and just running around like a crazy person. It's not like r rolling around like a, like a dog on the, on the ground and barking. Like, that's not in the Bible, guys. Like that, that's, no, that's not there. It's not there. And so for us to think, for, or for people to think that, hey, like, this is the mark of maturity. The mark of maturity is that those who are most expressive during worship are, are most filled with God's spirit and most spiritually mature. And those who are, are less responsive or are less demonstrative in worship are somehow less mature. That didn't match up with Scripture. What scripture tells us is that maturity is measured by the fruit of our character. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That we begin to look more and more like Christ. Listen, I've been around Christianity and church world a long time. And I've seen people who are hardcore worshipers. I mean, man, they are very expressive. And, and you would think in a worship service, man, they must be really godly. But man, there is this blatant, unrepentant sin in their life. And I've seen people who, man, they look like they are frozen chosen. Man, they are, it is a statue. They ain't moving. But there is deep godliness and maturity in them. You can't judge it. You can't judge it by that. That is not the judge of maturity. It's not the judge of whether or not a person has the Holy Spirit. 
And so um, I want to give you just a couple quotes before we go. Is that God is far more concerned with his position in our hearts than the posture of our hands. That's what he cares about. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. And I love this quote from uh, Matt Redman. He's an author and uh, has written a, a lot of worship music that you probably would recognize. He says this. He says, singing is easy. The proof is always in the living. <laughs> Singing's the easy part. True worship, the hard part of worship is, is how we live. And that's our hearts this morning. That we want to honor God, not just with our lips, not just with the words that we sing in a worship service, but with the very life that he has given us. So I want to give you just a spot, just you and the Lord this morning. If you, you'll take a moment just to bow your head. If you'll blot out any distractions. It's just, just you and God this morning. I want to give you a chance to connect with him. We've had a chance to read his word. Be sensitive to the leadership of his spirit. We do want to walk in step with his spirit. But walking in step with his spirit should lead to change. It leads to to spiritual fruit. It leads us to live a life that looks like Jesus. To have that sort of character in our life. And so before we get real worried about what the posture of our hands looks like in worship or the vibe or the feel in the room. It's really just the condition of our heart. It's not about the words that come out of our mouth or how loud we sing or if we're on tune or not. But what's the condition of our heart? What's the posture of our heart? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your grace. God, none of us deserve it. We can't earn it. We can't be religious enough. God, we just receive it in gratitude. God, thank you for not only dying for us, but for giving us your Holy Spirit who lives inside of us and transforms us from the inside out. God, we want to bear fruit in our lives. Help us to, to have the fruit of the Spirit manifest. God, crucify us. Crucify our flesh so that you come out. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.